Mirror of the Sea by Joseph Conrad The Grip of the Land It is difficult for a seaman to believe that his stranded ship does not feel as unhappy at the unnatural predicament of having no water under her keel as he himself at feeling her stranded. Stranding is, indeed, the reverse of sinking. The sea does not close upon the water-logged hull with a sunny ripple, or maybe with the angry rush of a curling wave, erasing her name from the roll of living ships. No, it is as of an invisible hand had been stealthily uplifted from the bottom to catch hold of her keel as it glides through the water. More than any other event, does stranding bring to the sailor a sense of utter and dismal failure. There are strandings and strandings, but I am safe to say that 90% of them are occasions in which a sailor without dishonor may well wish himself dead, and I have no doubt that of those who had the experience of their ship taking the ground, 90% did actually for five seconds or so wish themselves dead. Taking the ground is the professional expression for a ship that is stranded in gentle circumstances. But the feeling is more as if the ground had taken hold of her. It is for those on her deck a surprising sensation. It is as if your feet had been caught in an imponderable snare. You feel the balance of your body threatened and the steady poise of your mind is destroyed at once. This sensation lasts only a second, for even while you stagger, something seems to turn over in your head, bringing uppermost the mental exclamation full of astonishment and dismay. By Jove, she's on the ground. And that is very terrible. After all, the only mission of a seaman's calling is to keep ships keels off the ground. Thus the moment of her stranding takes away from him every excuse for his continued existence. To keep ships afloat is his business. It is his trust. It is the effective formula of the bottom of all these vague impulses, dreams, and illusions that go to the making up of a boy's vocation. The grip of the land upon the keel of your ship, even if nothing worse comes of it than the wear and tear of tackle and the loss of time, remains in a seaman's memory an indelibly fixed taste of disaster. Stranded within the meaning of this paper stands for a more or less excusable mistake. A ship may be driven ashore by stress of weather. It is a catastrophe, a defeat. To be run ashore has the littleness, poignancy, and bitterness of human error. That is why your strandings are for the most part so unexpected. In fact, they are all unexpected, except those heralded by some short glimpse of the danger, full of agitation and excitement, like an awakening from a dream of incredible folly. The land suddenly at night looms up right over your bows, and perhaps the cry of broken water ahead is raised, and some long mistake, some complicated edifice of self-delusion, overconfidence, and wrong reasoning is brought down in a fatal shock and the heart-searing experience of your ship's keel scraping and scrunching over, say, a coral reef. It is a sound for its size, far more terrible to your soul than that of a world coming violently to an end. But out of the chaos, your belief in your own prudence and sagacity reasserts itself. You ask yourself, where on earth did I get to? How on earth did I get there? With a conviction that it could not be your own act, that there has been at work some mysterious conspiracy of accident, that the charts are all wrong, and if the charts are not wrong, that land and sea have changed their places, 
that your misfortune shall forever remain inexplicable since you have lived always with the sense of your trust the last thing on closing your eyes the first on opening them as if your mind had kept firm hold of your responsibility during the hours of sleep you contemplate mentally your mischance till little by little your mood changes cold doubt steals into the very marrow of your bones you see the inexplicable fact in another light that is the time when you ask yourself how on earth could i have been fool enough to get there and you are ready to renounce all belief in your good sense in your knowledge in your fidelity in what you thought till then was the best in you giving you the daily bread of life and the moral support of other men's confidence the ship is lost or not lost once stranded you have to do your best by her she may be saved by your efforts by your resource and fortitude bearing up against the heavy weight of guilt and failure and there are justifiable strandings in fogs on uncharted seas on dangerous shores through treacherous tides but saved or not saved there remains with her commander a distinct sense of loss a flavor in the mouth of the real abiding danger that lurks in all the forms of human existence it is an acquisition too that feeling a man may be the better for it but he will not be the same damocles has seen the sword suspended by a hair over his head and though a good man need not be made less valuable by such a knowledge the feast shall not henceforth have the same flavor years ago i was concerned as chief mate in a case of stranding which was not fatal to the ship we went to work for ten hours on end laying out anchors in readiness to heave off at high water while i was still busy about the docks forward i heard the steward at my elbow saying the captain asks whether you mean to come in sir and have something to eat today i went into my cuddy my captain sat at the head of the table like a statue there was a strange motionlessness of everything in that pretty little cabin the swing table which for seventy odd days had been always on the move if ever so little hung quite still above the soup tureen nothing could have altered the rich color of my commander's complexion laid on generously by wind and sea but between the two tufts of fair hair above his ears his skull generally suffused with the hue of blood shone dead white like a dome of ivory and he looked strangely untidy i perceived he had not shaved himself that day and yet the wildest motion of the ship and the most stormy latitudes we had passed through never made him miss one single morning ever since we left the channel the fact must be that a commander cannot possibly shave himself when his ship is aground i have commanded ships myself but i don't know i have never tried to shave in my life he did not offer to help me or himself till i had coughed markedly several times i talked to him professionally in a cheery tone and ended with the confident assertion we shall get her off before midnight sir he smiled faintly without looking up and muttered as if to himself yes yes the captain put the ship ashore and we got her off then raising his head he attacked grumpily the steward a lanky anxious youth with a long pale face and two big front teeth what makes this soup so bitter i am surprised the mate can swallow the beastly stuff i'm sure the cooks ladled some salt water into it by mistake the charge was so outrageous that the steward for all answer only dropped his eyelids bashfully 
There was nothing the matter with the soup. I had a second helping. My heart was warm with hours of hard work at the head of a willing crew. I was elated with having handled heavy anchors, cables, boats without the slightest hitch. Pleased with having laid out scientifically bower, steam, and kedge exactly where I believed they would do most good. On that occasion, the bitter taste of a stranding was not for my mouth. That experience came later, and it was only then that I understood the loneliness of the man in charge. It's the captain who puts the ship ashore. It's we who get her off.